Yeah, thank you very much. And of course, I should like to thank, first of all, the uh, Fitz of uh, Franklin Fund, and in particular Jan and Pavel for inviting me and ha giving me the opportunity to talk about these ideas. And I think the main message in the end, uh, which I would like to convey, is there is not one possible ontology which reproduces quantum mechanics, and this is Bohmian mechanics, um, but I think there are many of them, maybe even uncountably many, I don't know. And <clears throat> what I'm going to show you is to sketch some ideas which at least in principle can be made into an ontology, uh, which is based on a completely different notion, not on notions of particles, not on notion of position, not on notions of trajectories, no quantum potential. So I think the well, what is in common maybe with what Bohm did in 1952 is to show these things exist, it is possible. Um, and the starting point for me is, um, uh, it doesn't work, presumably I have now the... Mm. Oh, it doesn't. No, it, it's, the problem is that it doesn't react to anything which I do. Let's see what it does now. Yes, hopefully. So the starting point for me is to, to question what is actually the meaning of location or the meaning of position or what do we mean when you say a particle is somewhere. And uh, we are so used to, to using these expressions that we often don't think about it anymore. And I claim that there are at least two different positions which one can take. One is to say, well, space consists of points. Uh, and on purpose, I didn't make these points, giving them a topology, saying which points are near or far away, or even a geometry. Let's say space consists of points, and we say an object is at point three. That's the usual definition of, <clears throat> or the usual way we talk about where an object is, to define exactly the point where it is at a given moment. But there is a completely different way, also used in history, and that is to say, well, an object is defined by its relations to other objects. And I think this is something which we know all of when we use, for instance, the space of society. What is my place in society? It's not defined by where I am, it's defined by the relations which I have to other people. So <clears throat> we can also use this concept of space, and it has been used in history, as I said before. And so in that sense, I distinguish a kind of embedding space, and this is what Newton space for me is, and also Einstein space, where we define the location of an object by saying at which point it is, and there is a second option which we have, and this is a relational space, which was, for instance, favored by Descartes and Leibniz. And we define the location by an object by to which other objects it is related. And when we define this, we come automatically to a kind of function. I mean, you can think of relationship as zero or one, but you can also define a relationship which has a certain, have a certain strength and it's in principle even possible to find situations where you can define a relationship or specify a relationship by a complex number. Uh, so there are many possibilities to have these relations, but what is important is in a relational space where objects defined by their relations, we use fields to describe the position in principle or the location of objects. And uh, so this is the starting point for me. So a relational space is defined by the set of possible relations or by the relations between the objects of which it is made up. And um, <clears throat> what we see of this space is only a large scale remnant. And I don't want to specify what happens at a microscopic level. I don't know what happens there. But at a large scale random, what we see is maybe the geometry of that space. 
Now, when we have objects in that space, they are defined by their relations to these spatial um, points. Well, points is, is, is not a good, good name because it doesn't make sense to speak of points. Uh, the shape is defined, by, again, by to which other objects it has relations to. And um, when an object moves, it's not that the object itself has, follows a trajectory. What changes are the relations. So that was the idea of Descartes. Changing the relations is what corresponds to movement. So this is the movement of an object. And you see it's no problem in a relational space to say an object is related to two different uh, regions in space. By the way, I will talk most of the time about space and objects. If you don't like it because you say, well, we are living in a relativistic world, replace space by space-time and object by events. So then you talk about the relations events have to certain spatial or space-time uh, entities. But I will mostly stick to this non-relativistic version in a similar way as, let's say, for me, Bohmian mechanics is non-relativistic. So just drawing the picture differently, a relational particle has no problem to be at two positions, two places at the same time. And um, another thing which I find very nice in this uh, picture is if I take Feynman's sum over histories to calculate amplitudes, probability amplitudes for propagation, the standard interpretation is a particle propagates along path one and it propagates along path two and path three, which is actually something which I never understood what it means. In a relational picture, you can say, well, the relation one between a particle and a spatial point propagates along path one. And the second relation propagates along path two, and so on. And then you have this propagation of relations. And that, in my opinion, is much more natural uh, than the picture of summing over possible paths. Um, when you have two objects, it could be that they are related in some sense, in the sense that they are immediate neighbors, but they look miles apart with respect to what we conceive as space. And uh, suppose, now that's very speculative, but some people did, it's not, not only my idea. Suppose entanglement is the nature of relation between objects, then you can say in this kind of space, entanglement is an immediate connection between two objects, and they are not far away. They are only far away with respect to our notion of the underlying space, but they are not far away in this relational space. So this could be a way to avoid non-locality despite Bell. Everything could be local, but nevertheless, it seems from a perspective of classical space as if things are non-local. And I'm very happy that at least two talks mentioned that we make assumptions about space-time when we say any ontological interpretation of quantum theory has to be non-local. And uh, so this is something, one thing where I uh, <coughs> would say this is a different way to look at what space is. And uh, it was only recently, or let's say about a year ago, that I learned about this ER equal EPR conjecture. Um, <coughs> And uh, unfortunately, I don't know enough about it in detail, but the idea is that entanglement might, via a duality transformation, be related to Einstein-Rosen wormholes. So it's a similar idea. It's the idea that somehow, when there is entanglement, you have a direct, immediate neighborship in some way between these two objects. Um, so let's think a bit, let's speculate a little bit about these relations which we have. We have relations between spatial points and spatial points down here, which on large scales gives us the metric. We have relations between, let's say, objects, which we call particles, and spatial points, which we describe by the wave function. And maybe between particles and particles, it's entanglement. And um, <coughs> I wouldn't even exclude 
that the wave function describes in a way a form of entanglement between particles and what we call space. Uh, so these spatial objects in, a, in an effective way. So these are not maybe all different types of relations. They just look different to us. So propagation of relations is purely local in the sense that you can only make friends with somebody if you have already a common friend. Uh, <clears throat> so only if there are already relations between, let's say, this object here and here and here, then in the next step you can have a relation there. So relation propagate only in a local way. However, when we have interaction with an external system, they can break non-locally, or they, it looks as if they break non-locally. Everything is local, but for us it looks as if some non-local thing happened. So in this space, it appears to be a non-local reduction, but <clears throat> that's only because of this setup of relationships. So I found it quite strange, actually, to think about uh, entanglement. How is, does entanglement propagate? Uh, entanglement always propagates locally, either, either to direct interactions of particles or by entanglement swapping. So that's exactly this. But you can break entanglement non-locally. And uh, <coughs> so this is, would be quite natural in such a relational space. Now let me come to the measurement problem, which of course would be the natural question to ask. Why do I always observe particles? And I would like to give a metaphor. So you can think of many possibilities to make this metaphor into a real let's say ontology, but I'd like to stick with that metaphor to give you an idea. Suppose you buy an e-ticket, and the e-ticket is stored in some main computer. And uh, this e-ticket is not yet reality. I think in the words of the uh, Nikola before, I would say it's res potentia. So every print out in, let's say, an airport is connected to this main computer, and that defines the relations in this network. And when you go to one of the computers, to one of the printouts, then you usually get the e-ticket e transformed into a boarding card. And that's the measurement, and that's where something becomes real. That's the transition from race potentia to the actual object. And um, of course, what is missing here is the probability uh, aspect, but you can easily think, um, I hope it doesn't happen too often, that when you go to one of these printouts, that you do not get a ticket with a certain probability, and you go to a second printout, and there you get it with a certain probability. So that would be the idea of a measurement. Once you have your boarding pass, you can never get a second one, and you never get half of a boarding pass. So as soon as you got the boarding pass at one of the computers, all others are blocked. So that's what one might call the collapse. So in the beginning, the document existed as a virtual entity. It's not spread over the network. It is somewhere stored in this sense. Then it becomes a reality when you enter your e-code and you want to make a printout. You never observe half of a boarding card. And, uh, <coughs> You never observe that one printer prints only half of it, and you get the other half of another printer. And uh, <coughs> you never get two boarding cards with the same e-code. At least you shouldn't. That's the idea. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> I know that this uh, is not what I propose as an ontology for what we should use in quantum mechanics. But it gives you an idea that it's very easy to make such an ontology. I have to say I come from neural networks. So I'm simulating neural networks, and there we have exactly these mechanisms. Uh, we saw yesterday a picture of David Bohm with Carl Pribram, and Carl Pribram is famous for introducing field theory in neural networks to describe the activity of neurons in terms of fields. And uh, <coughs> so in these neural networks, I can easily think of mechanisms which do exactly the same. Um, <coughs> that you get an activation only at one neuron with a certain probability, and all others are blocked. Um, so it's not difficult to make this into an ontology. The problem for me is there are so many, probabilities, so many possibilities that I don't want to specify them. Let me briefly compare Bohmian mechanics with this um, 
let's say, <coughs> relational space idea. Um, <coughs> so in Bohmian mechanics, you can say the wave, how much does that mean? Uh, three minutes. OK, fine. <laughs> Uh, in Bohmian mechanics, uh, the wave function acts as a guiding field. It lives in a configuration space in the solution of Schrodinger's equation. In my case, the wave function specifies relations to spatial points. It also lives in configuration space, uh, and it's also a solution of Schrodinger's equation. By the way, living in configuration space is not such a problem in this relational picture. You can think of uh, a person who actually uh, had two e-tickets ordered for himself and his wife, for instance, and you go to a printer, and the only way that is that you get both tickets at the same printer. And that already means these two e-tickets are entangled. They are not independent. You can choose where you want it, but if you want one there, you also get the other there. That would be entanglement in this simple picture which I had before. So here we have particles which have a point-like position, and they move along trajectories. If you want to speak about particles, if you still want to call them like that, uh, their position is determined by relations to spatial points, and motions are changes in these relations. Again, in both situations, even though I know Basil, I don't know where Basil is. Ah, uh, oh, there you are. I know you don't like it. Uh, <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> um, Space is, for me, I think in Bohmian mechanics, space is somehow a distinguished basis. Uh, but in contrast to others, for instance, to Pauli or so, uh, I don't see why it should not be, because space is the only space where we have a locality principle, or at least where we believe in a locality principle. Nobody is astonished when a high momentum and a small momentum particle can interact with each other. Why are we astonished when a particle here and a particle there interact with each other? So space for me is distinguished, so I have no problems with that. Relativistic formulation, we'll, we heard something about that yesterday, may be possible, but again there I would say even within Bohmian mechanics you have several possibilities. You can also make a guiding functional for a field. That would be a completely different way to formulate Bohmian mechanics for a quantum field theory. And so you see already that the ontology is not necessarily fixed. Here, the rel uh, relativistic formulation, I said that already, presumably requires relational events instead of relational objects and then relational space-time. And uh, <coughs> finally, non-local changes of the guiding field are here replaced by completely local changes in the relational space. So that's the idea. Let me come to the conclusions. So, Position may not be a property as we sometimes treat it in quantum mechanics, but rather a relation between objects and spatial entities. I don't want to change the formulism. I use the same formula, the same equations as quantum mechanics because I think they give very, very good predictions. I only change the interpretation of what the wave function means or could mean. Um, <clears throat> sometimes, for me at least, this is more natural, but Again, with the words of my free speaker, it's a matter of faith, maybe. And quantum theory, based on a relational notion of space, in my opinion, can have both locality and objective realism by, of course, changing the nature of what space is. So thank you very much for your attention.